starting late, and I do want there to be time for just a few questions. I am immensely pleased uh, that we have Stan Douglas here at the AA today. Now, his gallery sent me his CV. It ran to, I think, more than 20 densely packed pages. Uh, and he has, of course, shown at all the regular venues and biennales you can think of, and also at many venues you've never thought of. So I won't say any more about uh, those sites. I do want to just mention that he had a recent long-running show in Stuttgart, 20 years' work, um, which finished, unfortunately, last month, but of which there is an excellent catalogue available. I want to allow myself just a moment uh, to tell you how exciting, complex, and important I think Stan Douglas' work is. I saw Der Sandmann around 1995 in one of those familiar venues. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I was fascinated by the screen in front of me. Of course, I recognized the reference to Hoffman's story, The Sandman, and to Freud, who wrote about it in his work on The Uncanny. Yes, I had also heard of Schreber Garten, a legacy of the father of the famous paranoiac whose memoirs Freud analyzed. There were many voices, bodied and disembodied, many times and many places. This complexity of voices, times and spaces opens up a space in history, outside of history's linear narrative. This is a space for the story of dispossessed groups and the stranger. It allows us to piece together the stories left outside his story. Later, repetition and permutation came to mark a great deal of the work, and the rhythm set up by endlessly permuting elements itself marks the channel, challenge to linear narrative and teleologies. Just one more word, a tip. Stan Douglas's uh, 1998 win place or show was, of course, bought by the Tate. It's not currently on show, but when it is, please don't miss it. And now I ask you to welcome Stan Douglas. Good evening. Um, let's begin my talk with a disclaimer. Uh, tonight I'd like to go through a lot of the, the research that I do in order to develop an idea for a project and uh, to unpack some of the references that I believe are uh, condensed in the, uh, in the various works. But, it, but by no means to expect any audience to understand um, everything that's there, um, that I say is there in the works, or that I, I hope or I assume is there in the work. Um, certain uh, viewers will have certain uh, access of reference to what's inside, but I hope ultimately there's some kind of sensual analog uh, between the different layers of the work that will allow anybody who knows uh, watch, how to watch a movie or how to watch a, a television program is able to get access to uh, uh, some of these contents. Now, as I say, I try to find some kind of uh, way of uh, making a, a poetic condensation of these different ideas um, in, in the works. Um, but they've had two basic uh, ways of uh, being manifest over the last uh, 20 years or so. I've divided it into uh, periods of uh, spatial and temporal works, and they distinctly uh, take different approaches to um, looking at how um, we can represent different ideas of time, space, and how we um, endure time and space together. Uh, the earlier works, the spatial works, uh, have a, a few features in common. Uh, number one is an idea of uh, what I was thinking of called uh, idioms of representation. The idea that uh, any kind of representative media, like uh, even film or television, uh, speaks an idiom that is a local language uh, tied to a time or a place. And like any language, when that uh, language goes into disuse, um, uh, a certain way of seeing the world disappears with it. Uh, because languages, you can say something in English, you can't say in German, and vice versa. And same goes for these different um, idioms of uh, cinematographic media. So in these works, uh, the most pure in a way were the first three, or Champ, Ruskin, and Evening, uh, which were looking at uh, uh, a certain period of time and representing uh, an event or condition of that time using a means of representation from that time. So this idea to sort of see if we could see through the eyes of the people who were living that moment uh, in those works. With works like uh, there's Zanman and Nutka, uh, I start to break my, my own self-made rules. Uh, but something that's still consistent with all these works is this uh, idea of spatialization of uh, a cinematic uh, device. Uh, with uh, montage itself in Orchamp, uh, synchronization of image and sound in, in Ruskin, 
with evening, the simultaneity of a broadcast. Uh, in Der Zandman, uh, the idea of uh, compositing images together. In Nutka, uh, the, the sort of basic uh, feature of uh, interlacing in, in video, where two, f two different fields are uh, interlaced into a single image with, with video. This I realized I was sort of going somewhere else with Der Zandman to a certain degree, but with Nutka, um, I, I knew it was uh, quite different because I couldn't find an idiom of representation um, for the 18th century. This depicts an event which took place uh, on the west coast of Canada in, in the 18th century, so I had to find something new uh, entirely. So I gave myself a bit of freedom in, in how I was approaching these ideas, the, these spatial, spatialized works, um, but uh, as a final gesture, in a way it's sort of out of sequence with uh, the chronology of my work, uh, for the final work of the 20th century I made, uh, Le Détroit, I wanted to, to um, sort of make a, a farewell to that century by addressing a, a, a number of important uh, features to it. Um, the, the look of this piece, which is, uh, again, a spatial work which uh, manifests itself in the space of the gallery. Uh, the, the viewer's body has to negotiate the space and in some way making the space by virtue of their presence in the room and how they walk in the room. Um, in this work, uh, which resembles, when you see this, this double film projection, synchronized film projection uh, in a space, it resembles a, a rayogram or um, a solarization effect, uh, an early 20th century surrealist technique in photography, but also um, 1960s experimental film techniques of uh, doing layering and packing uh, positive negative uh, films together. I'll talk more about that later, but I'd like to talk a bit about the um, photographs that are in a way part of uh, uh, the project I did there. Often I do photography as part of my, my projects. Uh, I consider them to be autonomous bodies of work from the, um, uh, the, the film or video installation I would do because they have specific interests or, or themes. Um, but the process of doing these photographs allows me to take, spend time in a place, investigate its psychogeography, um, to meet, pe meet people who live there and to understand what the look and conditions of that place actually is. Now, in the case of Detroit, it's a very famous, well-known city for, for many reasons, for, for music, uh, of course, for industrialization, certain techniques of industrialization uh, uh, innovated by Henry Ford with the assembly line, uh, certain kinds of trade unionism, and then, of course, for being an exemplary city for the kind of urban uh, decay that uh, took place in the Midwestern industrial cities in the United States. Um, on my first visit there, I was sort of struck by the visible and invisible borders that are, that are sort of all the, all the way through the city, making it in, in many ways a, a city of villages where we just have certain pockets of people doing one thing and then uh, sort of empty expanses in between that. Uh, borders which are sometimes to keep people out, uh, well, almost, almost in every case to keep people out, but other cases to uh, define the borders of people who do sort of a form a village within these different areas of Detroit. This is an image of the Book Cadillac Hotel, one of the most uh, opulent uh, hotels built in the U.S. when it was uh, constructed. Um, it now stands empty. Looking closely, you see uh, shuttered doors and empty windows, many of them broken. Uh, the building beside it is empty as well. Uh, recently, there's been attempts to make this into, into condominiums as the downtown core um, sort of comes back to life in Detroit. But when I was there 10 years ago, um, this was the sort of uh, state of abandonment you'd find many places, many of the large grand buildings in downtown uh, standing in. This is a Lutheran cemetery in East Detroit, beside the Packer plant built by Albert Kahn, who was uh, uh, Henry Ford's favorite architect, industrial architect, um, who built the factory part in the, sort of in the distance in, in this modular uh, system, which was very admired by Mies van der Rohe and uh, by Le Corbusier. In fact, this building appears in Towards a New Architecture by Le Corbusier, trying to talk about how uh, the, the form of the pr production inside the space uh, was somehow mimicked by the form of the building itself. Kahn, of course, himself did, didn't really think this to be any kind of valid architecture whatsoever, and his own buildings that he most admired were in uh, sort of pastiche styles of 19th century forms, but uh, modernist architects found a lot of use for it. This is the site of the, or an image of the YMCA and YWCA uh, in downtown Detroit on the site of what became uh, Comerica Park, which was the replacement for the Tiger Stadium, uh, sponsored by the Comerica Corporation. Uh, many of these cities in the Rust Belt of the U.S. Um, have tried to make their urban cores, which are typ typically depopulated, uh, typically uh, um, uh, are quite poor compared to their suburbs, uh, make them enter enter entertainment districts to which uh, people could come to see sports, entertainment, etc. It has worked to a certain degree in Detroit, but not uh, to the extent that they, they had hoped. This is the Michigan Theater on the site of uh, uh, the Henry Ford's first uh, workshop where he built a Model A Ford. Uh, built as a film palace in the 1920s for a silent film, uh, but the owner decided he'd make more money in, in this building if it were a parking lot than having it as a, uh, as a theater, and so that's what 
why it looks this the way it does. No Photoshop involved here, just a straight photo uh, <laughs> photograph. This is a, uh, a home beside uh, the Jefferson High School in, in West Detroit. Um, and you see this nicely tidy uh, home uh, owned by a woman named Michelle who was born there, went to that high school. Uh, it's a very tidy fence around it too. And um, she uh, is in a way, or her home is in a way emblematic of the greater territory of Detroit where certain pockets appear in, in an empty space. There's the sort of phantom grid of, other, of the rest of the homestead block, which are not there. And as you see later in other photographs, this idea of uh, uh, domestic uh, f uh, flora going out of control in different areas. Um, on the, let's see, I always get this wrong, I believe the east side of Detroit. So Detroit is on top of Canada. Windsor, Ontario is below Detroit, and Detroit's on top. So I'm always confused which way is, is east and which way is west. Uh, this is a um, place called Fox Creek. Uh, where people on the Detroit side often have uh, these boat launches that feed into uh, Lac St. Clair. Uh, but if this moat were not enough, uh, they put up a cyclone fence to separate uh, East Detroit from, or sorry, West Detroit from uh, Gross Point, which is one of the uh, richer neighborhoods that, su that surround uh, the, um, uh, the, the central city. Inside uh, uh, Gross Point itself, this is uh, Gross Point Farms. Um, it's a private park, which seemed unusual to me because this kind of location could not be private property in Canada uh, at the seashore, but there's a big fence I'm shooting over top of and a small sign if we're in good enough resolution saying private property, no trespassing. Back in Detroit, this is an image of the Go Lightly, Educa Go Lightly Educational Center, which was uh, apparently the, one of the best elementary schools in downtown Detroit, um, surrounded by, and, and still is, uh, sort of by an experimental wheat field being uh, uh, planted by the Wayne State University, seeing if they could find a way of uh, using vacant land for uh, agriculture. And in fact, around the corner, there was a, a man who had bought a number of houses uh, uh, around in sort of empty area of, of the city um, where he had, uh, using houses for barns, growing alfalfa, and had livestock as well. This is a, a burnt, a collapsed house, burnt house, which is in a way emblematic of a lot of the way in which Detroit was depopulated. Um, of course, on the left, you see a uh, very crudely cut lawn that's been cut by the city to, to keep uh, garbage from, from piling up. On the right, you see a, a, a tightly manicured lawn that's done by the owner to, uh, because he, he's proud of his uh, place where he lives and wants to be comfortable. In the middle, a collapsed house, which is in a way is emblematic of the, um, the burnings that would take place on something called Devil's Night. Uh, Devil's Night is the night before Halloween, in which in, um, uh, in some cities, people just run up to a door and run away. I knock on the door and run away, uh, put toilet paper in the tree, that kind of thing. But in 1984, uh, kids came into the suburbs and uh, in a way created this auto de fe where they um, uh, burnt uh, 1,200 homes and 3,000 cars. And this escalated over a number of years until community groups were patrolling the areas to stop that from happening. Uh, but still, it does happen on occasion, as you see, see here. Back in, Detroit, in downtown Detroit, uh, near Jefferson Avenue, this is the, um, the uh, Horseshoe, the last bar standing in a place called, depending on who you talk to, the Black Bottom or the uh, Paradise Valley, uh, which was uh, home to a lot of the southern blacks who came to Detroit um, uh, to staff industrialization there. When they put the I-75 highway in uh, Detroit, uh, which I'm standing on to shoot this photograph, um, they destroyed the neighborhood but promised them new, new housing. But of course, uh, that didn't take place and the, the community was dispersed. Where they were supposed to go was a place called uh, uh, Lafayette Park. The master plan was, was done by Mies van der Rohe and the row houses, in fact, were detailed by Mies van der Rohe. The towers were, however, completed by something, somebody else. And when I was there, you could buy these uh, townhouses for roughly $40,000, which is like wonderful, um, uh, wonderful buildings to, to live in. And ironically, the, even though the developer said he could not afford to make uh, public housing out of these towers, uh, when in Detroit's decline, they, they for all became public housing as Detroit went into something that I call conceptual housing, where instead of actually building and maintaining um, public housing, they would give people certificates and they would have an itinerant force of uh, tenants to go from one place to another while they were, uh, before they could be exploited uh, for other uh, economic means. Uh, this is the Gem Theatre uh, being driven from its sites on Woodward Avenue to a new location, again making place for um, Comerica Park. And this is a, a view of Herman Gardens, which is uh, one of the largest, when it was built, one of the largest um, housing projects in uh, the U.S., uh, probably covering a 100-acre uh, area. 
Um, we see the empty windows of the, uh, the row houses uh, facing each other uh, across this, this walkway with uh, the, the glass broken uh, inside, the, um, a lot of the, the copper wires been stripped out and, and other things uh, taken for it to be salvaged. This, this project was uh, very self-contained, very robust. These buildings were all brick or, or um, cast in place cement buildings. It even had its own steam power plant for, for heating. Uh, but because of the deterioration of the um, a social culture within the, the, the project, there's a sense that this place was in some way, some way evil and could not be redeemed in any way. Nobody wanted to go there. So instead of uh, renovating it in some way, they, they destroyed the, in, the entire place. Um, part of the problem with these, these two gangs and different, different, different factions who control different parts of the housing project, and in fact, when I was shooting this photograph, there was gunfire nearby. This is an image of the, um, another image of Herman Gardens, uh, looking at section um, eight, where I took that previous photograph, and section uh, five, uh, and in the foreground is the shadow of section six, which is uh, uh, where I, I shot this film called uh, uh, Le Détroit. Um, Le Détroit is not actually the work I wanted to make in Detroit, um, I wanted to somehow work with a book I found called Legends of Le Détroit, which was a uh, sort of chronicle of uh, Indian and, and French myths about the area from the time of the founding by, by Detroit of, by Cadillac. Uh, but that kind of got out of, uh, out of hand and I, I couldn't really realize what I wanted to do. Um, so in a way it began, was sort of my five year plan to develop um, a work, to make a work that could actually um, do things I didn't expect, to tell a story I didn't intend. Um, but for Detroit, I had to sort of clean the slate and do something else that would be uh, much more simpler, much uh, more straightforward, because I'd, in a way, over-researched the other project. And this, this project was uh, Le Détroit, which is a, uh, a double film projection, sometimes in 16 millimeter, sometimes in uh, 35 millimeter, always anamorphic, which in a way is a, um, uh, a film that erases itself. Um, in the center of the space, there's a translucent screen that's uh, a black translucent screen that reflects and transmits light equally on either side. On one side of the screen, there is a, uh, a positive projection of the film, and the same film it, in negative is on the opposite side, but two frames out of phase. What this means is if there's a, a registration of two images, the image sort of goes gray and they, they cancel each other out. But if there's a temporal uh, difference between the two images, if the camera moves or if the character moves, uh, we see it revealed in sort of this funny bias relief effect that I described as being uh, like a, a solarization. Um, this is uh, a ghost story, which I'll admit to because the actor, actress in, in the story said, uh, uh, she couldn't understand what, what she was doing in this place, but then she realized uh, after a minute, she said, uh, I'm a, when she saw the car that she was driving, which in Canada uh, we would call a ghost car because it's in, uh, it was a uh, Chevy Caprice, and usually cops drive Chevy Caprices in four or uh, Chevrolet towns or Crown Victorias in, in four towns, and unmarked ones in Canada are called uh, ghost cars. So she saw that and realized that she was playing a ghost, this character who is uh, in this building, uh, in a, a, a sort of this narrative loop where she is uh, in her car, goes into the building, um, uh, sort of fixes disturbances that are in, in various places, goes into a wall and tries to pull something out of it. We ne never actually find out. She's scared off and runs because of a loud sound, runs back to her car, disturbs the things that she corrected when she came in, goes back into the car, is about to leave, but then realizes she has to stay in and get that thing, goes back in again. So this film is a, is a true loop in a way that there's no real beginning or end. It doesn't, uh, um, it's not a, a sort of linear nar narrative that's being repeated. It's actually, you can come in at any point and watch it for as little or as long as you like. Um, and this is something I discovered early in a work from 86 called Overture, but then kind of forgot when I made um, uh, Orchamp, Ruskin, and, um, and Evening as I was trying to develop my cinematographic skills, but then with Dozan Man and the later works, uh, almost all these works, there's some sense of these works being um, uh, integrated and somehow adapting to the space of a gallery where audiences come in at random moments and actually can uh, decide when to turn the work on, when to turn it off by, by virtue of their presence. And to let you know what I'm talking about, I'll give you a, sh a short excerpt from this work from 1999 called Le Détroit.
Now, as I said, Windplus SEO is kind of a transitional work, um, and I was working on this, this project and uh, Lutetois simultaneously. This is a work which, um, among other things, is uh, uh, permutes in such a way that it has 20, 200,000 variations of the uh, little six minutes uh, sequence. It's uh, basically the same thing, but every time it loops, it loops a bit differently. You see the, the action from more from one character's point of view or another character's point of view, and little details change as the, um, as the, uh, the piece uh, permutes over time. I just want to make a work that would sort of have this sort of sense of uh, strangeness to it. And I thought after the experience of doing that, I could make this more recombinant work. Um, but this, in fact, was a much more uh, daunting task than I imagined it was. And having to sort of uh, spot check the possibilities of the combinations of all these scenes was a, a very, very big job. So I kind of got, got stuck with that. Um, but I, again, I resumed this, this project, which uh, had another step in the middle, uh, Journey into Fear, which sort of was realized in um, uh, Suspiria. And then I've been sort of mining these ideas in, in the later works, Inconsolable Memories and, and Cloud Assassin. So the idea of making a work that uh, is, is uh, permuting, uh, changing itself in real time, uh, a work that sort of becomes a, um, a place as opposed to a, a, a narrative. It's something that you, you go to when you go back, it's somehow different. And any two people seeing it at a different time will have a different experience of the work they're seeing. But nevertheless, they're still seeing the same thing and having to uh, sort of maybe negotiate or, or talk, compare experiences. Uh, just like you, you would in actual life. Um, during to fear, um, the work which is sort of a, the step between Wind Placer Show and Suspiria um, is a, a remake of a remake of a film uh, that was based on a novel by Eric Ambler. The novel and the original film uh, directed by Norman Foster uh, for the Mercury Players in 1942 and starring Orson Welles. It was supposed to be a Welles uh, follow-up project to Citizen Kane, but he got distracted and went on to other things. Uh, it, it tells a story about a, uh, set during World War II, the story of an um, uh, arms dealer named Mr. Graham who is um, uh, trying to make a deal in Turkey. He thinks he's having some bad luck, things almost fall on him, almost hit him on his head. You know, some bullets, stray bullets uh, uh, come by. Eventually Orson Welles, as a Turkish official, convinces him that uh, he's actually the object of an assassination attempt. And he sends him back to uh, the States on a, a cargo ship. On the ship, a man named uh, Mr. Muller appears, who's a, a Nazi agent who tells uh, Graham, um, OK, uh, you have a choice. Either kill you, I can kill you now, which for me is messy and inconvenient, uh, or you can go, go into Genoa and uh, say you're six for six weeks, and that will give the, uh, the Nazi government a, a, a military advantage in World War II. Uh, in the end, Orson Welles appears and saves the day. Um, uh, surprisingly, that this film is a the remake of the film is in a way superior to the original because it uh, uh, takes a lot of the more uh, tenuous um, plot devices out of the film, but it also adapts it to the, the current period in which it was made. Um, the one from '42 was set during World War II, a period in which um, politics was uh, or power in the world was brokered by politics by politics or theoretically so. Uh, but by 1975, it was clear that power was being brokered by uh, economics and by monetary powers in the period of the oil crisis, where certain political negotiation was impossible and economic means were able to uh, grind certain economies uh, to almost to a halt. In this case, we have Sam Waterston, famous later from Law and Order, uh, playing against uh, Vincent Price um, in a uh, in, in updated to the period of the oil crisis. Um, Waterston's Graham is an engineer surveying for oil in Turkey, and uh, Price's uh, Muller is working for an unnamed cartel who would get an economic advantage in, in some kind of deal if uh, Graham gets back late. In the end, um, Watterson saves, saves himself with a, with a flare gun and a very spectacular ending. Just, I mean, and so the, the re my remake, set in a period of supposed globalization at the turn of uh, our, our century, um, is again the, the third step in these, these sort of pivotal moments in um, uh, 20th century history. To give you an idea of the, the two-hander that I based the majority of uh, the dialogue in uh, during Defurian, or the, the scene in, in during Defurian, uh, here's uh, the part where um, Mr. Graham meets uh, Mr. Muller for the first time. Looking for, isn't it? No, Mr. Green. I think I 
I suppose you sit down so we can have a nice little talk. Who are you? Sit down and I'll explain. So with uh, Mind Your Interfere, the, the characters have changed. Uh, Graham is a pilot, a woman pilot, uh, uh, who's the person who brings a ship into local waters. And uh, Muller is a supercargo, person who looks after a dangerous um, uh, cargo or expensive cargo on a container ship. And they're on a container ship called the Fidela. Um, their, their conflict is sort of has a, a similar connection, but the, um, uh, the, the context is, is quite different. And, and this comes out quite clear in their dialogue. In this work, I want to make a work that was, uh, had, in a way, no original, uh, a work that would, be, uh, would also change itself over time as it was uh, elaborated in, in different languages. I, I did this by um, doing something that's truly global in a way, by making a work that mimics the, um, say, life of a Hollywood film as it goes into the world and uh, in country, uh, country after country is dubbed into a, a local language. So far, Journey to Fear has been dubbed into uh, seven languages in uh, English, German, Turkish, French, Brazilian Portuguese, Korean, and Mandarin Chinese. Every time it is translated into uh, another, another language, uh, certain things have to change in how the dialogue is, is played out. Like in uh, Turkey, they, there is no concept of apocalypse. We had to find something else would be, be appropriate. And of course, different techniques are, uh, exist in these places. See, so what I'm working with here is the fact that when you dub a film from one language to another, there's no way you can actually exactly match the movement of the lips to the sound of, uh, of the, the character's voice. So you can say almost anything, and that's what happens in, the, in, in this piece. So one, for any moment in the, in the film, um, and I won't talk about how the, how the montage works, but uh, in any one moment of the film, there are five simultaneous dialogue tracks that go with it. And according to certain rules, a computer will, will uh, flip a coin, find a random number, and then make a decision as to which of those five tracks to play at eight different branching points. Um, so the one track is based on that uh, two-hander with uh, Vincent Price and Sam Waterston. This, you know, if you don't do what I say, I'll kill you. Uh, Mulder's doing a stock promotion. He has to get there a day late. Um, but the other four tracks are um, uh, sort of composites of the uh, and so uh, uh, condensations of uh, s episodes from The Confidence Man, a book by Herman Melville. Melville wrote this, this novel in the age of uh, high capitalism in which either one con man or s uh, seven con men, one con man and seven guises or seven con men, are trying to appeal to people's sense of charity or greed uh, to get their money. And these, these, two different, uh, these different attributes are placed on these two characters, Muller and Grimm, as they have this conversation, uh, in which the, the whole underlying condition of uh, 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 capitalism is never ever questioned by, uh, by what they're saying. Uh, I want to show you a, a clip, and I'll, I'll sort of give you an idea of how it works by showing you the same scene uh, in four different ways, uh, as they say, four uh, very different things. First, uh, with the two of them talking about zoology. If somebody told you there was an there was an animal, a duck's bill, and an otter's feet, covered in fur and laid eggs, would you believe them? Just think about it a minute. My instinct would be to know more about the person talking. You'd laugh it off until they offered a reward for its capture. You'd become an expert, not for curiosity, for self-interest, profit. You don't understand what I'm talking about, do you? You're talking about a platypus. A platypus? A duck bill platypus? An animal from Australia with duck's bill and fur that lays eggs. Maybe it's just apocryphal. Apocalypse. And then crew morale. Well, what do you want me to say? Tell me the truth. Truth is, the crew's soft. They hate to work. Their revenge is to undermine confidence in my ability. Then a new invention. Are you sure he has the patent? Yeah, I think so. You think so, but you're not sure. Do you know how many patents have been taken out since 1960? And then Graham's friend Goneril. Why are you telling me this? Let me finish. I don't get this touchy. Was she coming on again? Can't blame the husband for getting upset. So from this journey to fear, um, I felt I had the, the technical skills to uh, make this piece called Suspiria. I won't go into why it's called Suspiria, but maybe if you know the original film, you'll, you'll uh, be able to figure that out. Um, this was originally shown in Castle, sort of a live performance, uh, but later Later, I've been sort of uh, have a, a canned version of it, uh, where it, it was actually rewritten a bit and uh, uh, composited in different ways. Um, this is a place called the Hercules Octagon at the top of uh, Schlosspark Wilhelmshöhe in, in Kassel. 
Uh, it's the highest point of the um, uh, of the uh, this, this park that's there. It's full of a follies, this uh, a water cascade that comes down, and then uh, a one-third scale Scottish castle, a three-dimensional painting, uh, the gate of hell, various things. Um, it was built by a Landgraf, Landgraf Karl in the 18th century. It sold his rural population to the, to the English to fight in the U.S. War of Independence. These were the Hessians who uh, uh, washed and crossed the Delaware to um, uh, kill in their sleep. Um, so at the top of this, uh, this octagonal building, there's a, a big spire with a, a, a three-meter statue of Hercules, bronze statue of Hercules there, in a way representing uh, Karl's uh, um, ego ideal. And um, uh, this, in a way, functions as the same as a church spire in a medieval town where you're always seeing this, this uh, church spire everywhere in the town, so the eye of God is always upon you. The same for the people who live in Kassel and uh, uh, Landgraf Karl. So in a way, th this piece is a piece about surveillance. Uh, the building is a, uh, is a building that sort of has that same function or had that same function. Um, and uh, the idiom I, I'm adopting in this work is that of uh, surveillance cameras, and that's what we, uh, we'll, we'll see in a second. Inside the building, it's, uh, it's had this very strange uh, spaces. I have no idea what they're used for. When it was built, maybe some kind of strange ceremonies or parties. I'm not sure. But now it's the home to the biggest colony of rats, or bats, rather, um, in, in the region. Um, and there's actually a society of bat lovers who go there and uh, take care of them. But the whole building is, uh, uh, is fake. It's all cast cement, uh, made to look like weathered stone even when it was built in the uh, 18th century. And certain areas are used for storage of this. One part is uh, cherubs, and this one has got these uh, classical figures from the, uh, the, cas the castle down below. <coughs> so in this work, uh, I wanted to make a, a site-specific work without leaving home in Vancouver. Uh, so I did that by uh, doing some com computer imaging of the, the spaces uh, that would allow me to make a, have a simulation of, of, of the space that I could work with uh, actors in, in Vancouver. So from uh, four precise camera positions and a very specific camera uh, focal length, uh, we, I, I commissioned an architect to build these computer renderings of the space. Here, every frame represents a, a degree of a, a pan going 360, which were done looking up and down at five degree increments. So I could exactly compose these shots in the studio in Vancouver and the actors in the space that would, in a very sort of uh, low-tech way, composite the live surveillance camera image with the stuff that I had pre-recorded um, in, in Vancouver. So in the, the Vancouver studio, it was just be a, a big black room with black curtains. Actually, this is the actual surveillance cameras. There's camera four, cameras one and two. And um, this is the character called the innkeeper who's walking to a, a black painted staircase in this black studio would otherwise have these sort of tape lines marking out where um, the different uh, walls would be, so people don't, don't walk into walls. Here he's sharpening his knife. And here's the same scene, uh, composite with a live image. I discovered by mistake that if you take um, two different video signals with a YC uh, setup, if they're in sync, you can mix the luminance or black and white uh, brightness material from one, one image with the chromolence or color formation from the other image and lay them on top of each other like this which uh, looks different as uh, different times of day, like if it gets darker or lighter, um, you will have different color effects going on, and, uh, but it sort of fits together quite nicely. And because the, everything was shot with the same kind of lens focal length as the surveillance cameras, we could match perspective, and these things sort of sit into place. So, so in, the, in the Hercules, there was this, little, this sort of rack, this little fridge-sized um, device with um, four DVD players, uh, vertical interval switchers, um, uh, musical mixer, and a computer that was uh, sort of controlling all these pan and tilt cameras that could look up and down and uh, every, every which way, sort of generating the, these, uh, these stories up there. Um, in the daytime, this live image was uh, broadcast to the museum uh, and shown in the, in the gallery, and then at nighttime it was broadcast to the TV station and it would broadcast it all night, so this constant story with bats flying around of uh, these, these funny stories. People soon realized it was actually a live thing and in a way a public space, and so they decided to go in there and uh, make an intervention. Uh, people protesting uh, deportation of uh, refugees in Germany uh, spray painted stop deportation on one wall behind this place where the actors would often be, and then uh, kind mentions to illegal. Now, Castle is famous for document, of course, but it's also famous for uh, a pair of brothers who live there, the Brothers Grimm. Uh, who compiled uh, all of these French and German fairy tales into the, the famous fairy tales we all know so well. Um, and of course, the Suspiria by Dario Argento was influenced by the Disney version of, uh, uh, of, of the fairy tales. 
Um, in this, uh, working with a, a novelist, Michael Turner, we condensed all 210 fairy tales into 256 different narrative uh, elements uh, that can be re recombined. Um, each of the tales was somehow condensed and transposed onto a series of characters who would reappear in different ways. Oops. The main one is Elsa, who is um, uh, a woman who sort of wanders around homeless in the woods, um, kind of replacing that uh, Hans character that in, in the uh, fairy tales is often the one who, who slays a dragon or defeats a giant or marries a princess. Here she's been given a, a, a magic sack that makes soldiers appear to do her bidding. And here she's found a, a cache of gold. Here she's been transformed into a donkey. Here she's had to sell her eye to her friend because they're lost in the woods, and her friend has food, she doesn't, so she sells her eye to her for, uh, for, for food. Here's the innkeeper who is a, a homicidal maniac and in league with the devil. This here is the innkeeper with the devil who are telling Elsa they, they have to cut off her hands. This is Elsa's hand that she took off as a trick, being held up by the, the servant who uh, works for the innkeeper and is kind of a, an alcoholic and uh, a neurotic. Uh, this is the, uh, the devil again getting Elsa to sign a contract to work for him for seven years. This is St. Peter. <laughs> this is the dwarf who appears and, uh, with a cudgel and saves Elsa on a few occasions. This is the giant who Elsa tricks, works for, for him for a while and tricks, her on, uh, tricks him on various occasions. This is the merchant who's being killed by the innkeeper. This is Elsa's friend, the one who wanted the eye, who's about to whip her goat. This is a witch who tells uh, Elsa how to get out of a contract with the devil, and so on. So in this work, each story has got a, um, uh, a tag on it saying, uh, identifying Elsa's um, special location. Is she in the inn? Is she in the woods? Is she in the underworld? Uh, is she accused of a crime? But also her uh, uh, economic situation. Is she rich? Is she poor? Or it doesn't matter. And according to these certain rules, the different uh, narrative chunks are randomly recombined into different configurations that uh, will tell an endless story, basically. There's also music as well, which is composed of six different songs and as many as 35 different tracks, um, seven or five of which play together simultaneously, remixing itself in real time. So it's sort of a, basically an endless work. To play this thing out, it would actually last longer than all of human history that's, that's taken place so, so far. Um, each work, each, each story is sort of identified by a very simple structure. It begins with an epigraph, um, a, uh, a sequence of, of, story, of narrative storytelling with voiceovers, and then a musical section where the voiceover is stripped off and we hear, hear the music playing. Uh, the opening quotes are from volume one of uh, Capital by Marx, in which he talks about uh, witchcraft, vampirism, magical transformation, and, and such things. Um, the clip I'll show you uh, begins with a, a quote where Marx Marx um, talk, or is sort of ironically talking about the idea of uh, primitive accumulation using the idiom of, of the Grimm's uh, fairy tales. And in a way, this um, piece is meant to work sort of like pure capitalism itself. From two hours of, uh, of video material and two hours of audio material, they recombined um, to um, uh, make a work that lasts for longer than all, all of human history. So in a way, it's this uh, uh, a way of getting more than I put into it or getting something for nothing. And here's a, a, a chunk of one story from uh, Suspiria from 2003. Long, long ago, there were two sorts of people. One, the diligent, intelligent, and above all, frugal elite. The other, lazy rascals, spending their substance and more on riotous living. Thus it came to pass that the former sort accumulated wealth, and the latter sort finally had nothing to sell but their skins. <coughs> Whither so fast? For money. Late that night, while the servant was out walking with Peter, a cat snuck into the pantry and stole off with the hand that was under her protection. When she returned, the servant was terrified. Elsa's hand was gone. Racked with guilt, she went to the gallows and cut off the hand of the thief to replace the one that went missing. The next morning, Elsa demonstrated to the innkeeper the reattachment of her hand. From her knapsack, she removed a small canister, applied the contents to her wound, and voila, the hand was back in place. Astounded, the innkeeper called for a bottle of champagne. 
A short time later, while in the market, a rich man took out his wallet to pay for his sausages. At that moment, Elsa, who happened to be passing, grabbed the wallet from his hand. It was then that she realized something was wrong. Elsa returned to the inn and demanded compensation. Elsa met Peter. Hey, can we have what you have? He said, and Elsa complied. An hour later, she met him again, and again Peter asked. Hey, man, can we have what you have? Again, Elsa complied. This happened a third time, and Elsa gave him half of her money. Down to her last pennies, Elsa stopped at the inn and bought herself a beer, when who should sit down but Peter? Again he asked her for half of what she had, but by now Elsa was broke. So Peter picked up Elsa's mug, drank half, and told her he'd do her a good turn one day. Elsa was out walking when she came upon a charcoal burner about to sit down to a meal. Please join me, said the burner, extending a hand. As you can see, there's more than enough for two. Elsa felt warmed by the man's generosity. With that, she reached for her knapsack and took out her magic clock. She reset the table, this time with a variety of dishes which had miraculously appeared upon the linen. Both ate heartily. After dinner, the charcoal burner said, that was a fine meal indeed. Out here, every day is like another, and every night, potatoes. I would gladly trade you a cloth for this. Elsa was most impressed with the soldiers. She shook hands with the charcoal burner, but Elsa wasn't finished. She turned to the soldiers and commanded them to reclaim the cloth. The next evening, Elsa chanced upon another charcoal burner. They too shared a meal from a magic cloth. Afterwards, the charcoal burner exclaimed, that was a fine meal indeed. Out here, every day is like another, and every night, potatoes. I would gladly trade you your cloth for this.
The uh, music, by the way, was um, by Scott Harning and uh, John Medeski of uh, Medeski Martin Wood doing a pastiche of um, the soundtrack for Suspiria that was done by a, a sort of prog rock band called Goblin. Um, sort of taking up a lot of these uh, things I learned doing Suspiria uh, in uh, the other, other two recombinant works that I'll show today, um, I was able to use them in a much more uh, transfer, transparent fashion. The day, that, uh, the day after I, I showed the final version of Spirit in New York, I took a plane to, to Cuba um, to see what it was actually like, because there's all kinds of myths about Cuba, and sort of it's got a certain mystique in Vancouver, in Canada. Uh, one of our prime ministers was a good friend of Fidel Castro, and uh, we, you know, you never actually know what it was really like until you go, go there yourself. So because there's a certain biological limit to uh, how long Cuba will be the way it is, uh, it'll definitely change once uh, Castro dies. I wanted to go there to see what it was uh, like for myself. So I made a, a number of trips to Cuba, and at one point I spent uh, two months uh, living and working there, doing a, a series of photographs that I uh, called these repurposed places, or these photographs of places that are, <clears throat> in a way, a microcosm of Cuba itself, a, an unresolved dialectic in which it's not quite stopped being what it was in the past, and it had not quite become what it intends to be uh, in the present, and that's what these photographs document, looking at the architectural landscape of, uh, of Cuba. But the film I made there, um, sort of was, the, well, the structure I figured out right away um, when I was there, because um, I sort of saw this condition of things being partially completed and then being abandoned and then started over again. That's the constant uh, practice of, of uh, some, some problems that have been happening in Cuba since 1970. And uh, that, the, the structure I figured out quite, uh, quite early on uh, as a way of, of adapting a film, which I'd never heard of until it was given to me by the director of ICAIC, the Cuban uh, Film Institute, uh, called Memories of Under Development uh, by Thomas Alia. Uh, it's kind of ama it's an amazing film, beautiful tapestry of different kinds of uh, uh, cinematographic textures, uh, both uh, studio ma material, uh, things shot on the street with um, uh, sort of background action from people who are uh, just, just living there, uh, doing what, doing what they do, documented material, all combined to tell the story of a man named Sergio, who, after the revolution, um, does not leave the island like many of his uh, bourgeois family and friends. He's a, a property owner, and uh, he leaves, but he can't say quite why. Um, he kind of wanders around Cuba, um, having affairs with women, imagining past loves and that kind of thing, uh, in a, a reverie, and he seems like a, uh, uh, a Cuban Marcello Mastriani. And uh, until the end, where we uh, start to feel less sympathy for him when the um, missile crisis begins, and he takes this, uh, uh, in a way, global um, uh, or this world important uh, event as an existential crisis uh, uh, for himself. Um, but very a beautifully made film. Um, what I want to do is to adapt the film to a period in 1980 when something called the Mario Boatlift took place. This is when 100,000 um, Cubans left the island. Uh, but unlike the, the previous exodus, these people were often working class uh, Cubans, and actually many of them were black as well. Um, my Sergio is uh, an architect. Uh, from his look and from his accent, he's probably from a place like uh, uh, Oriente, so it would be a, a rural person who got this privileged uh, position uh, that he would not have if he left uh, Cuba as a refugee and uh, being a Spanish-speaking black man in the U.S. So there's another reason for him staying uh, in Cuba. But again, he can't put together the, the, how he became uh, what he was, becoming the, the very thing that uh, the revolution was supposed to get rid of, the personality the revolution was supposed to get rid of. And he can't put together um, the events in his life that led up to uh, <clears throat> what is potentially a, a fatal incident, which uh, you'll know about when you, when you finally see the film. And this is a 16 millimeter film. I didn't want to do something too elaborately technical for the, the, the for, uh, be inappropriate for Cuba. Um, so I made a very simple, um, uh, permuting system that would allow this uh, 60 millimeter film to uh, recombine with itself. So we have two reels. Uh, one is uh, five parts, one is three parts, um, and these two prime numbers uh, permute, uh, permute together to uh, give a roughly a 75 minute film out of uh, roughly 20 minutes of, of uh, uh, material. The way it works is various scenes within every section, every five minute segment. Um, that interlock with each other. When there's image on one, uh, from one projector, there's black on the other, and, uh, and vice versa. But occasionally images mixed together, and occasionally sound from one projector is mixed differently with sounds on the, on the other projector to make this uh, one thing we see on the screen. Each um, story, or each sort of uh, sequence of segments, is marked by the appearance of a title. Here we see uh, the five-minute reel has got uh, five adjectives, um, endless, another, a familiar, a tropical, and something else. 
Uh, on the other side, um, uh, three nouns. Uh, adventure, problem, and situation. So these um, sort of mark the time as a piece is changing, but when you start seeing adventure again, you realize um, something is changing. So even though the uh, soundtracks are, are different, we're seeing certain elements are, that are still the same, just as Sergio is sort of going through these um, uh, various events in his life in the flashbacks, in the present tense, uh, having been escaping from the boat, uh, being arrested, being in jail, and flashing back to his life with his wife, who's, who's left, and his friend, who's left as well. Um, and I'll just show you a clip of this, showing, showing one, one sequence uh, from Inconsolable Memories from 2005. Oh yeah, the, <coughs> I out, figured out pretty quickly it would be difficult to shoot in Cuba after being arrested a few times. Um, so I <coughs> found a way of doing it in a, in a more clandestine manner where I had a, a small HDV camera uh, and was shooting, shooting plate shots in Cuba. So any exteriors that you see are uh, done with a rear projection technique, sort of that old uh, 50s film techniques, so giving this sort of fantasy look to everything. And any interiors are uh, concrete objects, sort of, I guess, referring to Sergio's alienation from the place in which he lives. And here's a clip from uh, Inconsolable Memories from 2005.
So in, in that section, we, um, sometimes we'd hear uh, that music, sometimes we hear um, Sergio philosophizing using that tape recorder as an as a audio diary, and sometimes we hear him fighting with his wife who's pissed off that he's recording the fight of their argument that he provokes. <clears throat> Uh, the next work I'll talk about, and only one more to go after this, is uh, called Klatt's Assassin, um, a western that I made in, in 2006. That is a remake of, uh, in a way, a remake of uh, um, a work called uh, Rashomon by Akira Kurosawa. Um, of course, many of Kurosawa's films were made into, into westerns, and indeed, uh, Kurosawa uh, was influenced by the western form itself. Um, but uh, Seven Samurai became Magnificent Seven, um, Yojimbo became A Fistful of Dollars, uh, Rashomon became a really awful film called um, The Outrage, uh, starring um, uh, William Shatner, Edward G. Robinson, and Paul Newman in uh, brownface playing an Indian. Um, but, uh, so I just wanted to make, do, do better for this, this wonderful film by, by Kurosawa, which is uh, the basis of what is often called the Rashomon effect, this idea that uh, in witnessing uh, a reality, um, people have different recollections or responses to what's going on, of the reality of what's going on, uh, often based on their specific uh, self-interest. Uh, the setting I wanted to make for this, even though it's a Western and quite a generic in many ways, and it had to be just to make it uh, transparent to the audience, because I, I, it's a fairly elaborate structure. Um, it was set in the 18th century during a gold rush that took place in, in Canada. There are a series of gold rushes taking place on the west coast of North America, beginning in Mexico, going through California, briefly stopping in, in British Columbia, and then going up to uh, uh, the Klondike. Um, when uh, Billy Barker found a huge cache of gold in um, 18, uh, 1859, I believe, uh, as many as 30,000 um, Americans or Europeans crossed the border to come and, and make their fortune, and founded the city of Barkerville um, in, in northern British Columbia, uh, which had a sort of standing population of 10,000 people. Um, so a lot of money was being made, gold was being taken out of the earth, and, uh, but all, only the banks in New Westminster, the, uh, I, the, the mainland colony, was, was getting, getting the money. The banks on the island colony wanted to get uh, the money as well, so they had a plan to uh, have a build a road across a place called the Chilcotin Plateau and take boats up there and get the gold quicker back to their banks in Victoria. It's a quicker route to get there. Otherwise, you'd have to uh, take portages up the, fr uh, the Fraser River and, uh, and walk. It's very, very <laughs> These people were walking up to uh, get their gold uh, thousands of kilometers. Anyway, the people living there, the Chilcotin, were not happy about these um, um, people crossing their land, possibly uh, carrying disease because they just experienced a very uh, uh, nasty um, smallpox uh, e epidemic because uh, they weren't as resistant as Europeans to, to the smallpox virus. And they sort of associated Europeans with uh, uh, sickness and death and be, uh, a series of uh, uh, attacks on these, these the road crews uh, uh, began. The most elusive of the people running the, um, these attacks was a, a chief named Klatt Sassen, and supposedly his name means we do not know his name, uh, but that's the uh, name that the natives gave to the uh, uh, people asking. Um, he, was, he was elusive, and it was so elusive that the governor of Vancouver Island came to supervise the search himself, and then the Minister of Gold actually sent an offering of tobacco to Klatt Sassen. Klatt Sassen assumed that uh, uh, he was being offered a um, peace offering to come in to negotiate the end uh, 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 of a war, what he thought was a war, to negotiate a treaty. Uh, instead, he was tried for murder and he was hanged. Uh, uh, one, uh, as were six other of his uh, people in his, his war party, um, two, one was let free, one went uh, down for a further trial in Westminster but escaped en route. And that's kind of where my story begins. Uh, transposing the Ronin and his wife from uh, Rashomon, we have a deputy and his prisoner who's being taken down uh, uh, for a trial in, in New Westminster. Uh, and it's a deputy who dies, and various people in this story take responsibility for, uh, or uh, try to avoid responsibility uh, for that murder. Of these very various characters who appear in um, a series of, of uh, uh, cuts from different temporal zones, which I've depicted by this, this model, which I hope is not more confusing than helpful, um, in which we have uh, the, the space-time uh, manifold of, of Klatt Sassen. In a way, this all works based on the principle of the cut, which is the most important aspect in filmmaking. It's a negative space, it's a space where nothing exists, but that's where the fantasy happens in cinema that allows us to understand one character is looking at something else and understand uh, the, the sort of uh, position of everything in space that's uh, in, in cinematic space. Um, so it takes a while to sort of figure out what's going on, but eventually over time, uh, because it's so regular, I think an audience can sort of, start, sort of parse how these different uh, looping schemes all, all fit together and how they refer to uh, different moments in time. 
begins with a seven-part loop uh, in which the prospector and his partner are going up to gold fields to, uh, get, um, uh, to, to get rich. And uh, the prospector is getting lost, he, uh, uh, and he's, the partner's getting upset because he's telling us this interminable tale, and they're not getting anywhere, and he's a bit overweight, and he's tired of uh, this, this long walk. Um, but the, the prospector is telling a story he heard when he was there five years prior in, in this uh, roadhouse. And in this five-part loop, we have uh, the prospector meets the innkeeper and the miner who are telling stories about what happened the day before when there was a murder and a trial. Occasionally in this section, sometimes framing the following sections, we have flashbacks um, to the night before the murder in which the uh, deputy arrives, the prisoner arrives, and the thief arrives at the, at the roadhouse. Then we have the uh, uh, scenes from the trial which took, the day, took place the day of the trial, trial in which we have testimony from the thief, testimony from the, um, the miner, who's a, a German who went up there to make his fortune, testimony from the deputy who is... Uh, whose diary is being read by the constable, and a testimony from the prisoner that's being translated by the Frenchman, who's a trapper who can speak Chilcotin but not English, and the constable translates the French into English for the judge. And it sounds convoluted, but that's actually what happened um, in the trial of Klatt Sassen. And then we have, in, in the middle of the trial, we have uh, um, flashbacks to either the backstory of the prisoner, miner, and thief, or their uh, version of the events when the, um, uh, the deputy was killed. And um, all of this, because of the unequal length of all of the different loops, over time will go in a phase. And so they will tell uh, various uh, different permutations of these stories from different perspectives, uh, again, taking about a 45-minute chunk of material and making it last approximately um, uh, 69 hours before it repeats exactly. And here's an excerpt from Klaus Sasser from 2006. This is where it happened. The murder. That means we're going the wrong way. <laughs> You're right. I was 20 miles south <laughs> in a grove. Sure? Yeah, I'm sure. That's what they told me. Of course, I was never really convinced they told me the whole story. Uh, common sense. You never tell a judge something he didn't ask. You never tell a stranger something he doesn't need to know. So I said, do I get the choice? He said, you get a hundred dollars. <laughs> Insurgents. Perpetrators of the Butte Inlet Massacre. They're not so frightening ones. I hear that it's called a machuca pen, but, um, and the Indians went to war because they were going to keep it for themselves. Ah, uh, Indians up there don't care about gold. They just don't like white men. Right? Yeah. Gold's in Barkerville, in miners' pockets. I was going to make rich up there. I was going to use my engineer salary to stay. The only profit I get now is $100 for transporting this heat in the New West. $100, oh, no, shit. My engineer's watch is worth more than that. $100. Could have been rich. See, miners are all ignorant bastards, and they're easily taken. Have you seen anyone again? No. People don't appreciate being called ignorant to their face. You draw that gun, you and your companion will be sleeping in the jigs. Roadhouse is much more quiet since you read it right. It has only been quiet since the judgment is courted. Hey, you know, and that's a funny coincidence. So a whole circuit court pulled in the next day. What day off? When I got back from the lake, the whole circus was in full swing. All right. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was dark when I got to the roadhouse. There were already, uh, eight people there, including the innkeeper and his Chinaman. Deputy didn't want to talk, you know. I think he wanted to keep his eye on the Indian. Obviously, he turned his back at the wrong moment. <laughs> Who? No, no, I, I, I didn't talk to him.
sum up. Deputy lost control of his prisoner, and uh, he shot him with his own gun. Well, the, the deputy's gun. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a gun was in my hand, but that was my gun, and it was busted. You know, it was dirty or something. You can try it yourself. You know, I struggled with being in. You know, and somehow he, uh, he knocked me on the head and uh, knocked me out. He must have shot the deputy just to make sure, you know, like he'd be alive. Don't be hanged for it. What does that mean? Well, your reckoning is as good as mine. <laughs> you know, there are some things you can never know about people. And there is always something they will never tell you. Would you mind telling me where we are? Well, I think we uh, lost the trail for a minute. We lost the trail for a minute. Are, are you sure this is right? I mean, I, I can swear we're headed west. Hey, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. The trail veers west somewhere around here. But I just remember something else. So I'd like to finish by showing you a clip from a, <clears throat> a work from 2007 called Video that was uh, made on the occasion of a, a Samuel Beckett exhibition uh, at the Pompidou Center in Paris. Um, I sort of had a, a long standing interest in Samuel Beckett in 1988. Uh, I made an exhibition of um, his uh, film and, and television work called Samuel Beckett Teleplays uh, that toured for a number of years and actually played in London, I believe. And um, uh, so I actually somehow I got a reputation as being uh, well known in, in Beckett circles because no one had actually put that stuff together to, before or the videography I made. So in this work, I, I'm in a way I'm making a remake of a film done by Beckett called Film, uh, starring Buster Keaton. It was done in 1965. Um, uh, in f and, but in a way, what I do is I just use the conceit of uh, a film in which we don't see Buster Keaton's face, the main character's face, until the very end, the sort of punchline of the film. We um, see a character who's being pursued by a camera, uh, and he's trying to avoid any kind of human contact, any eye contact, even out of his, the pets in his apartment, or photographs of th things with eyes, or things that appear to have faces he's trying to get out of view. Finally, he falls asleep. The camera, which has always been pursuing him from behind, uh, spins around the room and then confronts him. He wakes up, and he's looking at himself, and that's kind of the punchline of the film. My, uh, my video is, uh, uses that same conceit, but we never actually see the face of the, the main character, who is not Buster Keaton, obviously, uh, but playing a version of Kay. Um, uh, this, in addition to being an adaptation of uh, film, it's sort of a condensation of the trial by Orson Welles. It was shot in Paris in 1962, starring uh, Anthony Perkins. And of course, it's the Kafka story of the trial. He's being accused of a crime he um, uh, doesn't understand. And in the end, uh, is only concerned more about what his punishment will be as opposed to what his, uh, his supposed crime is. Um, so our character, um, Kay, is uh, in the same situation. Um, but it's in contemporary Paris. Instead of being the um, sort of 60s new projects that uh, Perkins lived in in the Orson Welles film, film she lives in the contemporary uh, Paris suburbs. In fact, she lives in the same uh, housing project at Le Corneuve that uh, um, uh, oops, Juliet, I think, lived at in um, uh, two or three things I know about her, uh, that uh, film by Jean-Luc Godard. And sort of a tribute to Godard, there's the same, a, a color palette is being used of, uh, he used red, uh, red, white, and blue. I use uh, uh, dull red, uh, gray, and, uh, and dull blue. She's being pursued by, uh, by this camera, pursued by the police, uh, and then there's a, a very ambiguous ending to, to the work, which I'll show you. I was, at first, I had these different permutating ideas before, and I was going to put in uh, intertitles that would change over time. Oh, and it's also a silent film, um, like the Beckett film. There's only one, one significant sound in the, in the narrative action. I thought of doing a permutation thing, but I realized I was just doing a Stan Douglas, doing a pastiche of Stan Douglas, so I thought, just let it alone, just do, a, just do the straight story which nevertheless has certain uh, references to my earlier projects um, in the pursuit of the character in uh, Le Détroit, the housing project in uh, uh, Le Détroit and, and One Place or Show, and other elements that I, I won't go into now. So what we're seeing here is the sort of uh, the looping point, um, and there's a space in the middle where we're looking at a, a camera, which replaces the, uh, the wrinkled eye of uh, Buster Keaton, which we see in Beckett's film. First, like the, the folds of the skin in his eyelid, which opens to, to reveal his eyeball. In this case, we see a camera. And um, uh, without any further ado, here's an excerpt from a recent work from 2007 called uh, 
video. Oh, just one bit of further ado. It's um, we shot on HD video with the game turned up to 12 dB, so the image is very, very noisy. It's like those sort of sparkles of, uh, of, of, of video noise, of different color noise that uh, <clears throat> makes an interesting texture on the screen. It doesn't uh, reduce very well to standard definition video, so um, please understand. It's very, it's very dark, too.
and thank you very much. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Hello. Um, sorry. Um, my question is, um, why um, only reference? Why on why your work always based on reference? O on a reference. Why is the work based on references? Um, uh, there, there are many reasons. In a way, all these works are uh, exist from the sign of the ready-made. They're somehow they want to be. Um, themselves, but they can't uh, help acknowledge the fact that they have been uh, something derived from something else. Uh, combining uh, different elements, different uh, ideas which uh, preceded my making the work and somehow uh, acknowledging the depth of that, that previous idea. Also to find some way of seeing um, the work in, um, you know, in consideration of what that past condition was or that, or that past work was. I think it, probably the best example is the um, uh, inconsolable memories where we were seeing uh, a version of a different tale, but it's taken uh, in a 20-year period afterwards, um, and the, the social conditions are quite different. And if you imagine the conditions that produced the previous work and my work and the, the subject matter and, and situation of the previous work and my work, you can understand um, they, they can have uh, a dial with one another, and that's, that's why. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
chiming with, 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 with the other, and I'm thinking sometimes, oh, I want to really concentrate on this intimate loop, this present loop, and then at other times I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is going back to Kafka, and it's going back to Orson Welles' <coughs> film, or it's going back to Memories of Underdevelopment. And the two things sometimes, sometimes are in phase and sometimes out of phase. Well, there's a couple kinds of loops. There's like the, um, well, maybe three uh, that are present in the work. One is the, the simple loop, where it's just a loop from one end to the other, and somehow it's all middle, it's all this sort of liminal space. And that's the problem. I mean, if you do have a, um, I, I, they're not interactive in any way that you can actually sort of cue in on a certain micro um, narrative that's happening in, in a loop. Um, you have to sort of endure the, the, the structure I set up, but hopefully the structure somehow has some content. But I was just saying before, the, you have the, the loop, the simple loop, which is kind of a bad infinity. It's, it goes on forever, but it's always the same thing. Uh, in those uh, uh, Wind Placer show, um, uh, uh, Journey to Fear and uh, in Suspiria, it is, seems to be good infinity, something which goes on forever but changes all the time, uh, but really it is also another kind of bad infinity. And this is sort of, in those wor works I was using randomness as a, um, uh, a surrogate for freedom or a, a surrogate for, for, for transformation in some way. This uh, appeared to be transforming in a, in a, a way that would be uh, progressing in some direction, but really it is still stuck in this mechanical condition, which is... Uh, um, a really a, a bad infinity with the, the appearance of a, of a good one. But the later ones, I'm, I'm trying to use it as a structure that's uh, um, uh, using the, uh, the, the loop structure to be more um, um, generous towards the audience. It's not this random thing which uh, is always doing something disturbing, always something different. I wanted to work with a structure that uh, the audience, and temporal structure the audience could sort of uh, parse together like a, um, like when you see one of those reflexive um, installations by Dan Graham or Bruce Nauman where you're walking through a space, you're seeing your body delayed on monitors and it takes a while to figure out what's going on but eventually you get a mental image of, of how the displacement of your body is, is happening in time and space in those works. I, I'm trying to make the same thing happen uh, with the temporal space of these works. A question there? Yes. up some of the points that I wanted to raise already in relation to Brian's point. Um, I, was, I sort of find your practice absolutely staggering, I have to say, and it's, um, um, whether it's a bad infinity or a good infinity, I think for me the stake is a kind of uh, imminence um, that comes out of, uh, what it's a kind of reversal from uh, a kind of Euclidean space-time to a, a very, very Baroque uh, topology of emptiness. And I just, I just wanted to kind of say that. For me, I think the stake of it is a kind of imminence. And I just wanted to respond to that. I, I, do, I agree exactly. I mean, it's, there's well, two things going on, but it's pri the primary thing is that different viewers who are actually in the space with the work have a different experience of what it's going to be. And um, well, like, I went back to see the Stuttgart show in November, and I saw this... Um, bit of Suspiria I'd never imagined before. It was like the, the way that the music and the, the sort of buried dialogue and the pictures were coinciding was just bizarre and amazing. Um, and so to have these, these sort of things surprising me is part of what I, I want to happen, but it's also two viewers, as I said earlier on, two viewers will see the work, but in, in fact see different works that are in fact the same work. And that's the same as our um, you know, negotiation of the world as well. Last question. 